All right, guys, we've got a great episode for you today. This one, I'm hoping, is going to be a life raft to some of you out there who are stuck with a project with a detailer who is starting to make you feel nervous. You don't feel like they're going to finish the job, or maybe they've already given up the job. They're, you've already had to pull it from them, and you're looking for a new detailer. What are some of the considerations that you should have? What are some of the warning signs to keep you out of this situation in the first place? All that and more today on The Steel Forum. All right, Matt, so we got an email the other day uh, is, is from somebody that we quoted a project to for something that we call rescue detail. And it's it's a term, it's obviously not a universal term because I completely made it up, but I intend to make it a universal term, describe what it is, and I'm hoping that we can talk a little bit about both sides of this equation, the, the perspective of the, the detailer who needs to get into the job to, to rescue detail, and from the fabricator, uh, first identifying when he needs to get out from underneath a detailing contract and, and find himself a new detailer and then what are the steps that he should be taking in that process to protect himself so uh welcome how you doing doing all right doing all right we've been you know keeping real busy and it's the, the workload's been kind of drying up a little bit so we've been starting to push more into sales so you always find something else to to do and plenty of stuff going on around the house but yeah yeah. So if you're out there and you happen to have, you know, a, a thousand tons of nice structural steel or, you know, uh, who am I kidding to? If you've got that job where they haven't finished designing it yet, but for some reason they still want to put the anchor bolts in the ground and the dimensions don't add up and they need design calculations for the stairs, but the stairs don't actually fit in code, send the job to us. We'll give you a price and then, you know, draw it four times while the architect changes their mind. We'll be, we'll be happy to do it. <laughs> uh, so basically the, the, the premise was from this email that this, this customer had gotten into a job with another detailer and they had disappeared. They had, you know, kept pushing the, the schedule back. All of these things that start to indicate that you're not going to get a good quality. The approval drawings weren't what they were hoping for when they got them all of those, those indications. So right off the bat, what are some of the indications that you see that a fabricator needs to start looking at, at finding another detailer on a project? I usually things start to, they start out small. You know, you're, you're going to see things like schedules start to, to slip. Um, then you begin to have arguments over scope items uh, you start to see things happening where your job gets parked on hold because of a simple question, things like that, where, you know, they're, they're just trying to use stall tactics to kind of stretch things out because they're either overextended internally, they've taken on too much other work, and they're just trying to kind of kick your can down the road till they can get to you. Or you're going to see things like drawings that have numerous errors, you know, spelling issues. They're clearly not checked. They're not reviewed even by a most basic of competent detailer, things like that. And it, it just starts to accumulate, you know, one thing at a time, maybe you could overlook, but as it piles up, you begin to get that, that overwhelming sense of dread that this has gone wrong. Yeah. The, the first, the very, very earliest indication for me that your, your detailer isn't working, but claims to be, is that he hasn't asked any questions. If, if you get a set of contract drawings and you detail it and there are no questions along the, the, the line, then you need to go buy a, a million lottery tickets because you're about to win them all, <laughs> right? That's, that's not a thing that happens. And even, even if the contract drawings happen to be perfectly clear in all of their intentions, there are going to be questions about process unless you've been working with that detailer for 20 years and they know everything 
you're going to want to do the way you're going to want to do it. You know, how are you going to ship this piece? Are you going to break this down? What's the paint? It's not specified. Do you really want to galvanize this thing because it's in an exterior wall, even though it's not actually exterior? All of those questions uh, should come up while you start detailing a job. And if they don't, it's an indication that either they've got somebody junior working on it and they're piling up all those questions or they're just not working on it at all. Um, and, right. and you're going to need to find out which, which is the case yeah. on that. Yeah. And that's not always a bad thing, right? Like sometimes we'll quote a job and we'll say, okay, it'll, it's four weeks until you get design drawings or d d approval drawings. That doesn't necessarily mean that on the first week I'm starting to draw that. I might be starting it to draw it the second week and dedicating more resources to it. Now, if they're expecting to get it all done in the last week, that's not really appropriate. That's because of those questions that are going to come up. Right. They should you need to get somebody on that sooner to begin at least reviewing to ask those questions. You've got right. to start the job right away. Right. And that's but, an important thing when reviewing right. your detailing proposals too, to watch out for is, is, is this just an end date? When are we going to get start? And what we like to do is get those anchor bolt drawings right out right away, because in that process of creating anchor bolt drawings, we can almost always identify really bad contract drawings and, and know that we're going to run into problems. Yeah. I, it, it's almost a cliche, but you know, if, if the foundation drawings are bad the rest of it will be bad it, it's you know it, it, it like in anything if the foundation is bad the rest of it's going to fall apart so when you get your foundation drawings and you can't figure out bottom of column and there's no dimensions and everything is just not adding up you know whatever then there need to be questions asked and they need to get out early because you need to give the design team a chance to rectify that you don't want that but basically what you don't want to have is a four week timeline where you're expecting to do it in the last two weeks. And it's not until the day before it's due that you say, Hey, I can't, I can't go anywhere with this job because these dimensions don't add up. I need to issue this RFI and now your job's on hold. Yeah. And we've been schedule caught out the window. Yeah. We've been caught in that position before where we have the resources left to do the project. We're going to have to rush it. We're going to put overtime into it, but we're dedicated to maintaining that schedule but then we get into the job and it turns out that they've drawn an MC Escher building and we can't complete it. And now the, the customer's a little bit upset. So I actually think we might be able to do a little bit better of a job communicating our start date of really getting into it and, and letting them understand that just because, you know, four weeks is completion does not mean that today is beginning. That's, um, that's something right. that it, that's something that we've we've always worked towards is improving that communication because we found that that is the greatest struggle but it also serves the greatest good in a job is to be really communicating a lot with your customer throughout the job not just here's your drawings here's my bill but you know finding out exactly how they want to deal with a lot of situations a lot of a lot of fabricators that we work with um when you first talk to them, they, they sound like they want to be really hands off. They want to just hand you the job and have you do it and then get back to you at the end. But then you send that drawing in and they start, hey, how come you didn't ask many questions? These connections aren't quite how I would have done them. I thought you didn't want to be hands on. So I handled it. You know, so you, you still got to kind of check in with them throughout the process and just make sure that they're on board with everything that you're doing. It, it helps keep that communication open and ensures that they get the project that they're expecting in the end. This episode of the Steel Forum is brought to you by Web Doublers. Web Doublers, always required by the engineer until you show them the price. All right, so you're a couple weeks into the schedule now. The, the approval drawings are supposed to be coming out and you're not hearing from the detailer. You, you're not seeing the drawings. How do you tell the difference between this detailer is a little bit behind schedule and the drawings are going to be getting to me soon. And uh, on the contrary, when should you hit the panic button and start protecting yourself? I think maybe, uh, especially if, if you've done your own project management internally, which you should be doing, that you should have some familiarity with those drawings to begin with. 
and you should know what some of those problem areas are going to be. Check in with the detailer and ask, you know, how did you handle this? How did you deal with this section? What are your thoughts on this and that and the other thing? And if they're, I mean, it, it's like a book report. You can ask somebody a few questions about a book and if they didn't read it, they've got no idea. No idea what you're talking about. So if you just throw a couple little questions out there to kind of feel out what their their thoughts are along the way, then you're going to know if they're on your job or not, if they haven't even touched it or if they're into it. And, you know, yeah, I've, I've saw that. This is what I did. Or I was going to call you about that. And I just wanted to, you know, touch base. I just haven't had a chance yet. Things like that. Yeah. And the, I, I think there's, this defensiveness that I've always seen behind detailers start to get the ones who are, are, are the most defensive and don't want to tell you anything and are really kind of just dismissive of your concerns are the ones that you need to be the most cautious of. Um, well, it, actually there, I, I would say the second, the, the most cautious are the people who dodge your phone calls and emails, right? Oh Yeah. Yeah, if 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 you're not getting a response from them, if they're if they're not answering their phone in a reasonable amount of time, right? Um, and honestly, a reasonable amount of time it might be within a day because sometimes mm -hmm. we're not here, uh, or sometimes we, you know, get a call and right. just forget. You, you about should it. give everyone twenty four to forty eight hours to respond to anything. Yeah. Yep. And that that goes to you know if you happen to be watching this Mr. Project Manager, if, if you're going to need a, you know, material lists, a bolt list, whatever, you, you got to give us a day to get it. We will absolutely try to get it out within hours, but sometimes it, we, we just can't. Things go wrong. Right. And right. Nine times out of 10, it's not a request to have it in the next day or two. It's I need it right now you're holding up my order for bolts because you didn't anticipate that I was going to ask for it. It's like, well, right. right. I don't and know when do. you're going to order the bolts. And yeah. It, and it's usually prefabrication, right? It's not even, right. we've, it's we've issued this whole job. It's the, okay, well, we need to get an order in because we're, you know, we're getting a truckload and we want to make sure we have these bolts with it. So, right. You, if you, if get, you want a report on materials or bolts or anything like that, and it's not, along with all of the fabrication drawings, you want to be able to pre-order or get your quotes in and everything. You're going to need to establish upfront when you're going to need that. And if you don't, then when you call, don't expect instant response because we're working on other things, you know, and right. it, Oh, it, it just takes a minute. Yeah. But try being a detailer. Anytime you have to change gears, even for one minute worth of disruption, you have to change the job you're in. You have to lose all of that concentration you had on what you were working on. It really is a job that requires a lot of laser intensity focus. And you can't just be kicking all over the place. It, it causes a lot of mistakes to happen. So you have to stay on subject until you've completed it. And then you can find a breaking point and get away and, and do that report or whatever it is. Yeah. The, the most likely thing that happened is the format of what, of, of how you want that isn't something that the system reported. There's a bug. The, the file is corrupt. We're going to our backups, a, a million things, but each one of those things has a real potential of happening. And with detailers, it has a way of always happening. The time the fabricator says, I need this right away. And then mm -hmm. you end up looking like a schlep. So, uh, you know, be aware, be aware that a, a day is a reasonable time period. But then if you're not, if you're consistently not getting a response, not answer to phone calls or not, not emails either. You, that's, that's a really good hint that, that it's not going your way. Um, right. Then I think the next, the, the next flag is, okay, you hounded them. They were a couple weeks behind and they promised you next day. And that, that turned into two days that turned into three. Now you get your approval drawings. What do you look for? Today's episode is brought to you by Volcraft. Volcraft, you'll get your drawings eventually. Thanks. All right, so the schedule's pushed a little bit. The, you know, Tuesday turned into, last thing Wednesday turned into by lunch Thursday, and it came in, you know, midnight Thursday. 
what do you look for in the approval drawings as the, the project manager to make sure that you just didn't get spit out garbage and that those approval drawings are going to get through the process appropriately? Ooh. I mean, the, the first thing that I'm going to look for, honestly, is just I'm going to look at the plans themselves mm -hmm. and ensure that everything is kind of where it's supposed to be. You don't have piece marks kind of kicked all over the place. I'm going to look for the, the telltale signs of auto detailing. You know, so are the piece marks in kind of a little bit off places? Are they kind of jiggled all over the place? Um, does it does it look slipshod, basically, right? Right, right. Th does the 10,000 foot view look a little askew? Uh, flip through the pages and make sure that there's nothing plowed into the bill of material. That's a big one. The, the detailing uh, software I, loves I would I would caution you on that one, though, because there's been times when we've spent a lot of times scrubbing drawings, and this is a good set, and then... I don't know. The the magic button inside SDS happens and all of a sudden that piece is off the sheet. We've had three different people. I mean, literally our process is three different people go through those sheets to make sure they're okay. And then we'll still get a PDF with one sheet. That's it's got a hanging that, chat. That, that's off. So, I mean, yeah, that's an indication if it's a consistent problem, but if you get, if you get a sheet that's off a little bit, if you get, one piece without a piece mark. If you see a bunch of pieces without piece marks or with the system piece marks, that's a really right. good indication. And right. one of the things that I'll judge the quality of a detailer on um, are the, the enlarged views. Because you can always tell when a detailer's rushed, when they have like an elevator shaft with like 64 beams framing into it. That's usually, that's a, or a canopy and they didn't enlarge it. Instead, they tried to jam everything into this tiny Just space. Just into the roof plan. Right, and it wasn't clear. Um, right. And then if the section drawings, if there's no, if, if none of the, the other building materials are indicated, even schematically, to tell what this is interacting with, that's, that's a good indication that your detailer was, was lazy. Um, if those things are in or, a rush. Or in a rush. Right. Uh, right. In a rush is, is is probably the more appropriate. It could be either, though. Right, right. Could be either. But it, if if you fail to show the other trades going on around you, if you've got a, a a hung lintel and you can't be bothered to sketch in some brick, then you know you're really flying through that, and you're just printing out what the model has created. You're not taking any time to add in anything else, and those things tend to serve as your your spot checking as you're going you know if you have a location to face a brick and to toe of uh the hung lintel and you can see that there's that half inch gap you've got all that stuff kind of located and you can rapidly match that up basically if, if you've dumped it out and you've skipped the checkers dimensions you know or or you've you've skipped dimensions that are meant for anyone other than the engineer basically you, you're just trying to dump this out for approval and get it out the door because you don't care who else is going to look at it. You, you haven't designed your drawings for all the people that have to look at it. Just the one you're sending it to right now, then you've probably cut some corners elsewhere. Yeah. That that's such an important consideration just across detailing. Uh, I was talking to Chris Riley about it the other day and he was talking about the fact that those drawings aren't just meant for the fabricator and that's just this this huge misunderstanding by a lot of times the shop employees or frequently shop employees that were promoted out of the shop is that the only purpose of steel detail drawings is so that it can be fabricated and erected there's all of those dimensions have a purpose there's a reason that, that they're dimensioned that way it's important uh, if you don't understand ask your detailer why they're there. If they can't explain to you, then you've got a problem. But if you asked me, I'd be right. able to tell you why most of those dimensions are there. And that's critical if, if those are missing. Right. And not for nothing, if you ask your detailer why that dimension is there and their answer is because the system put it there, so I just left it. 
you need to seriously be questioning your decisions for which fired. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, there are some, I would say, kind of duplicate extraneous dimensions that I will leave in there because they're not crowding the drawing and they're not complicating it. It could be helpful. Um, but a lot of times it, it, in auto detail, it looks like garbage. That's why there is this whole subclass of detailing now called scrubbing. That, wasn't, that didn't used to be a thing. It was just that's, that's detailing. And that's, that's not really the case anymore. There's, there's, there's modeling and there's scrubbing, two separate steps. And I think two different specialties with different sets of skill sets. So I, I think it's a good thing for the industry that those have been separated. Right. If, if you actually sat down and talked with any of our detailers, they've got a preference. They either love to model and they're, they're great with that. Basically, they've got closer to that fabricator mindset. They like to put things together. They want to solve that puzzle. Uh, and then you've got your scrubbers and they just want to draw things. They just want to make it look pretty. They want to make sure that it's got all the information that it needs. They're more concerned with dimensions and symbols and things like that. And a lot of times people have a preference. Modelers yeah. hate scrubbing. Scrubbers hate modeling. Yeah, they're they're just a whole different way of looking at the same thing. It's it's that two D three D disconnect. I don't know, but it, a, a lot of people. I mean, I myself, I love modeling and I loathe scrubbing. Now, you know, when I started out, there wasn't a choice. I had to model it and then I had to scrub it. But it, now that things have kind of broken into specialization, more often than not, I kind of get to pick and choose. But that's also a benefit of being the boss. <laughs> yeah. So you know. I, well, I find other people to scrub for me so I don't have to. Yeah. And it's a, it's a successful retention strategy for us too, right? And recruiting is we can tell a detail of, listen, you hate scrub and drawing. So stop doing it. Come work for us, build the model, solve the puzzles, you know, create a building or don't worry about the RFIs and don't worry about whether you got this cope, right? Just make it look, Great, and follow the follow the rules that are very rigid for something once it's been modeled as to how this should be dimensioned, how it should look, and get that out. And those those having both of those skill sets is is a very rare individual, and it's it's important. But we're we're getting way off topic. <laughs> um, so what about things like you no know, paint notes by moment connections? that kind of stuff. What's the difference between, because we do make choices, right? To keep the pre-approval rush schedule, there's stuff that sometimes we choose to not worry about. What's the difference between that and the stuff that really should be in the, on the approval drawings and it's a red flag? I, I would be looking for the the notes that are more critical to the engineering and design side of things. So like you mentioned a no paint note, um, a no paint note because it's going to be a welded moment connection should, should be in there, mm -hmm. you know, but a no paint note. And I'm trying to just think of something kind of extraneous, but something that's going to be field welded after final adjustment yeah, it, it's, you know, a, a no paint note because you've got a, a bent plate top or a bent plate pour stop that's got a couple shot bolts in it to pin it in place. And they're going to adjust it and field weld it in place after the fact. Yeah, it needs the note, but it's it's not so critical at that. You right. know, it's not critical to the structure of the building per se. So those those sorts of things could be left off when you're in a rush and you can get them on checking. But the things that you need the engineer to see like, you know, at a moment connection, um, even a lot of times the no paint top flange because they're going to field install studs. That one's kind of questionable. You can look at that one either way. Yeah. No paint notes for bearing plate connections, things like that. Those should be in there because the engineer needs to see that you've actually interpreted the design and you've made all of your connections correct. And that's really what they're reviewing anyway. So they need to make sure you've done a competent job at making the connections function. But, you know, that, like I said, that extraneous stuff, that can be left off when you're in a rush and pick that up on checking if you're checking while it's out for approval. 
Yeah, and I, I think you really hit on the, the key point there, which is all of the information that the approver needs to be seeing and to respond to, and that's the stuff that you need to make sure is in those approval drawings. Um, if you're concerned about the quality of the detailing you're get, getting. And the, you know, this is usually with new detailers or detailers who have started behaving erratically. It's just like when you have a dog or a baby that can't talk, you deal with them the same way. <laughs> if, if all of a sudden they start behaving oddly and differently than they ever have before, it's, it, it's time to take them to the vet and stick a probe up their butt and find out what's going on. <laughs> it's something, something's going on. And it's, it's funny that we do the same thing with the babies and our pets. You just stick a thermometer up their butt. And it's, it's, it's the same. But if you have a relationship with your detailer and they've behaved the way they're always behaved, you, you probably don't need to, to take these steps. But if, if you're concerned, these are the steps that you should take. All right, so you get the approval drawings back, okay? Right. Is there anything, uh, sh should you be reviewing the, the notes the approver put? Or, you know, let's say you skipped the first step. You didn't do your due diligence when they went out for approval, which has been known to happen. You just were so You're excited to get the these drawings. the fabricator side. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You were so excited. So you get your approval drawings back, and they're absolutely bloodied up, Okay. Before you send them on, you need to look at them and look at the contract drawings and try to figure out why. Did the engineer take the opportunity, as they often do, to redesign the building in red on your approval drawings? If that's the case, send them on to your detailer and say, let me know what the price is going to be. We're going to tack on our profit. And you know anything that changes that I have to bill for, like a large material increase or anything like that, you know, I'll be looking into it, but let me know so we can compare notes. If you get it back and they said, hey, you forgot to put in all of your brace bays. I, I don't have any vertical bracing in this job. What the hell happened? Or all of these connections were supposed to be moment connections and they're clearly shown on the contract drawings and you, they're, they're not. You've, you've, they're all showing as just standard shear. Now you need to be really concerned about the red flags. Yeah. Yeah, it's because most drawings do not get checked before they're going to approval, okay? That's no longer the process because of the way that designs are done now or not done. It doesn't make sense financially as far as time goes to spend the time to check detail drawings that are just going to be revised and returned anyways. There's, there's no purpose in doing that. Right. Um, and, and so frequently what we, what happens almost every time is there is an artificial rush, rush to get the approval drawings in for approval, but then they just sit there for five or six weeks. And in those five or six weeks, all of that back end stuff will be happening to, to, to really do that thorough check. Um, or if it's, you know, in the idea or the head of your detailer with your understanding, that this job is going to be revised when it comes back. There are too many questions. The drawings aren't complete. Then to hold off on that checking process until you get the revised approval drawings and most likely revised contract drawings. Right. And, and as we got into using the MDM software so that, you know, the idea was we're going to check the everything before it goes out for approval. And we had a couple of jobs where that, it should have gone great. And, you know, we did catch things. And, and I do recommend using some sort of a model checking process, be it MDM or your own homebrew with some member custom properties, but some kind of a model checking process so that you ensure you are getting your best quality out that you can. But because we had checked the drawings, we build for checking the drawings. And when the drawings came back from approval, and they changed floor elevations, they moved everything, they just redrew it in red. We expect to then be paid separately for checking as a change order item because we provide checking on the contract drawings or on the contract once. This is right. now twice. 
So now in addition to all of my fixing and revising and you know everything that goes on there, you're going to have to pay me to check it again. Whereas if I hadn't checked it initially, a full check initially, then you know you, you still just get that one check and it's at the end. After everything's revised, we incorporate all those revisions and now we check at the end and, and all you're getting billed for is what it took us to make the changes happen. Right, and I think it's important right now that we discuss the fact that when we say checking, when we're talking about, we're talking about final ready for fabrication check. There are built into any good detailing system, several process checks along the way, things to, to catch potential errors, uh, you know, just what I think is, is becoming commonplace to call quality control in the process right. that should happen before approval drawings, making sure, you know, everything that should be there is there. We didn't miss a brace bay. We didn't miss a section of the building, that kind of, Thing. make sure the connections are complete that they're reasonable that junior modeler detail or whatever hasn't made some error that's going to make our customer look stupid and us look stupid in the end today's episode brought to you by hilti fasteners no our full company name is not hilti or equivalent all right so let's talk about the last step of this identifying which is the, the drawings already came back for approval. They're supposed to be checking and releasing for fabrication. They keep hedging. How do you identify the difference between hedging and your detailers just, they're, they're doing their best and they're just behind schedule. So give me some examples of what you're talking about when you say hedging, just so I can kind of play off um, that. We expect it to be ready sometime near the end of next week, but I'll let you know. That would be a hedge. See, to me, a lot of times the hedging would be, uh, you know, I, I expect to have it sometime next week where, you know, the fabricator hears Monday and the detailer means Friday at 11.59 p.m. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> you'll see what, it in your inbox first thing Monday morning, maybe. Yeah. Whatever your detailer tells you, take the latest thing that that could be reasonably expected to include and that's what you should assume you're going to get right but what the fabricator okay. they when they say they'd like it friday that means friday morning they want it to be sitting there blinking at them when they turn their computer on right right a lot of times the communication kind of works um where the detailer will include their expected target time but then they'll include the what if a miracle happens and it's really simple you know th this is the earliest it could possibly come to you and i want to include that that way you know if i pull that off you'll think i'm a hero but the, the reality is that's the date that the fabricator is going to hear when the detailer really means if i'm lucky i'll have it done at the end of that time period and that's, that's, that's another big communication thing that we try to work on a lot. And, and I think a lot of people struggle with is having that honesty because you want to give the fabricator, you, you want to give the customer a, a time that you think they'll be happy with, but you don't know necessarily what they'll be happy with. And it's also possible that nothing you could give them is something they'll be happy with. So you may as well be honest. You know, they'll, they'll send you drawings and they'll expect them back that afternoon. And the reality is they're not going to see them for a week. If you tell them it's going to take a couple of days and you've split the difference, one, they're going to be just as upset in a couple of days as they will in a week. And two, now when you don't have it in a couple of days, cause you really needed a week, they're going to be extra upset. Yeah. And I think one of the most important things is if the detailer is calling you to tell you that he's behind schedule that and that these are the reasons take take that into account things do happen we have uh, system crashes legitimately do happen bugs we all know happen 
and some of them, even with backups, are 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 disastrous. Um, we've got a, a a long list of times where we've had to spend days fixing something that we didn't know. You can change a setting, not realize it. You know, change your change your design method by mistake because you thought you were in project A, but you were in project B. And you didn't notice that the, the, the braces all recalculated and were reprocessed until things went bad. Right. Uh, so if, if, if they're, if they're upfront with you, I just bought my camera here. So if they're upfront with you, then that's a good indication and then they should give you an honest approximation of what it's going to be. The biggest thing I struggle with as a, as a detailing project manager is the super short schedules, right? When the fix is, this is a small project, it should take four hours to, to turn it around. And then I, I expect it to be done this day and then things jump in ahead of it in line. So I've, I've learned to basically say, you know, I expect it to be ready by in three days. And it's not to say that it's going to take three days to do, it's that I'm hedging. And I used to basically give people the true approximation. I think that Tom's going to come free after lunch. He'll scrub it up and have it back to you before the end of the day. And the, the message that always came back to me was you promised it for the end of today. And so yeah, the, I just, the number of times I've heard the phrase you promised yeah. over the years. Right. I just stopped saying those things and always added the couple days in. And if you're a good customer that I can trust and you say, okay, what's a, an optimistic look. I'll tell you what the optimistic look is, but it's an optimistic look. Things go wrong. And even the pessimist, the, you know, the, the cautious look, cause I'm not going to just, I'm not going to do that thing where I pad everything by a hundred percent. It's, it, it's not helpful either, but understand that Friday is an expectation, but it's not a promise. That's, that's when I expect if the normal amount of things go wrong, we'll have it Thursday. So I'll say Friday. If more things go wrong, it's a disaster. So, uh, so those are the, the, I think the indications, right. That, that you need to get into rescue detailing other than obvious, the obvious one, everything is wrong. Well, right? yeah. <laughs> if, if, if you check a couple things and it's just wrong, just, just run away, just run away as fast as you can. But the other part of it that I want to discuss, and I think maybe we'll do it after the lunch break so we can get in completely, is what do you do next? How do you save the project? How do you get it into another detailer's, job, detailer's hands? How can you save money in that process? And how do you save some of that time that you've already lost in those things? What are some of the steps you should take to present yourself? So we'll have that coming up here after the fake commercial break. All right, so you're Mr. Fabricator. You've got a steel detailing project that's got lost in the muck with a detailer who is, you no longer have faith in to complete the project. What are the steps that you should be taking to protect yourself first? And second, what are the steps that you need to take to get the project into a new detailer's hands to save you as much money as possible? Well, I mean, step one, you're gonna to need to examine your contract with that detailer. And if find out one. if you have one. And you, I hate that. If you have one, you really should have a contract. Nobody should have a business relationship with any other business without a contract. If you don't, you're killing me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the, the first thing is look at that contract. Find out what sort of termination clauses you have. What are your protections under that contract? And see what you can do to first of all just remedy the situation to try to get through the project if possible if that's not an option then you're going to have to let that detailer go and you know, now you're going to have to worry about are they going to attempt to lean your job you know you're going to need to have some documentation to show 
that you have some standing if they decide to bring a suit against you or to you know lean the project to to show that they were incompetent or they were unable to fulfill their obligations under the contract so that you can get away from them and at that point yeah. you also need to go out and find that new detailer to to finish the job and in a hurry usually yeah so first things first i think you have to get a hold of whatever you can of the work that's been completed right and you should use the whatever leverage you have with that detailer to exact that and i have to say most of the detailers who will get upside down on a project don't have the exacting contract terms that that you do and non-performance is is almost a a way out of any contract right because they haven't fulfilled right. their portion of it um but so for instance if you were dealing with a, a company that had the same contract that we do and our contract requires i think 90 percent payment before we'll release the model file to you because we the, the model file is like handing you our originals and it makes it too easy for the fabricator to not pay us for approval drawings and instead just oh here's the model here's all the work they already did can you just scrub these comments and, right. and just put it back um, it's never actually happened to us but i've had it done to other detailers that i know and so we're, we're protected against it but if we didn't, if we weren't meeting our schedules, if the contract was falling apart and I was afraid of getting paid, I would very much basically trade my model, my originals, my contract drawings. And that's an important part too. The contract drawings, the RFIs, all of those, those red line drawings, which hopefully they're maintaining are, are super valuable as well. So don't forget right. that stuff. Um, so basically use the leverage that you have to get as much of the work out of them that's not drawings because in the modern age the printed drawings are almost useless to the next detailer that's picking up the job right 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 um right because uh, the, the only the only point that the printed drawings are worthwhile in the end are final fabrication drawings and if you've gotten to that point you didn't have this issue yeah and it's a point that I like to, to strike home as soon as I get involved in one of these projects that's rescue is I need you to forget about the drawings that already exist. Mm -hmm. They're, if they've been approved, they have value in that I can refer to them for where I have questions and that I have to make sure that everything I do to produce new drawings matches those existing drawings. So inspectors right. don't have questions. But also, be, you have to be upfront with the, the GC and the engineer that, hey, this, this detailer walked on me. I'm using the old approval drawings to generate a new set of construction drawings. We're, we're going to take care of making sure that everything gets incorporated, but let them be aware. Because if you, if you try to, sh to sneak it in, and that inspector is handed a set of fabrication or erection drawings, that doesn't match what what is approved you're not going to like the result of that right oh yeah it's they're they're going to see that that difference i mean they'll even just be able to tell this was drawn in different software what, what are you trying to pull here right if you're not up front with everyone that that this has happened yeah oh, and, it's going to make for such a bad day when you go to put this job up and in every case I've seen, when you tell them, hey, my, my sub di walked on me, disappeared, isn't finishing the job, I'm, I'm paying these guys to finish the job, the, the GC is cooperative, right? They need their building to go up, and there's no amount of shouting that they can do to the other detailer. They should be happy that you've taken this on to get it done correctly and in a timely manner, and they'll support you in whatever message or methods that they can so you know there, there's going to be usually they recognize that now the fabricator is in a vulnerable position where you know if they push too hard they may lose the fabricator on the job and now they're even more behind right it's just right. getting some drawings taken care of isn't quite such a big deal as to 
you know, I'm going to have to put this job out for rebid. So one of the problems that I've run into in the past when I've gotten a customers come to me with a large job and they've got drawings that were approved, but never checked and then basically ready to release mm -hmm. is all right. This detailer is now off the job. Can you check these drawings, correct them and then release them? The, the, the first part of the answer is probably always going to be no. Uh, and the reason for it is, is fairly simple. By the time I have taken the steps to correct somebody else's model, it would have been more efficient for me to redraw this. And I know that sounds counterintuitive. It really, really does. But it's just like taking a engineer's model and then trying to fix all the mistakes in it when you don't know what they were thinking in the first place. It's, there, there's too much room for mistakes, right? I know my detailers. I have a relationship with them. I know where they're going to make mistakes. I know what, where they're not going to make them. I know what that model is going to look like and how it's going to be organized, sequenced, backed up, all of that stuff, right? Uh, what, what's your thoughts on Do you think a, a model like that can be saved? I mean, I always hope that it could be saved, but in our experience, and we've done this more than a few times, even getting SDS models, it has never gone well for us. Not ever, not once, where we have taken somebody else's model and then been able to finish the job without losing our asses at the same time. Yeah, and, and it, we, it's, it's strange because on the surface, it should be easy. Right, right. And that was the thing that got us the first few times that we did it. We said, oh, if you're going to give us the model and you're going to, you know, you're, you're going to get us this far down the, you know, down the field, we'll give you a discount. So not only did we have a job that was a, a horrific nightmare trying to fix other people's problems, but we gave them a discount. Right. We lost huge on those jobs. So yeah. after that, it was, you know, first of all, we'll, we'll take your model in consideration as a reference file. It is not anything we're going to give you a discount on and it is not anything we're required to use to create our final drawings. Right. And... If you want the accelerated schedule, plan on paying extra for that too. You know, and you're already in a bind, you you're behind on this job and now somebody else is going to have to come in and pick up the pieces. Plan on some overtime. This is not going to be cheap. Yeah, and it, it takes me back to an argument I always had with Shandrin was he would he would always say, "Oh, study the contract drawing so you can find all of the problems before you start drawing it." I never understood that. Yeah, you can find some problems, but until you really sit down and try to draw every bit of that building, you're not going to know what they all are. Right. You just can't. And that's why, you know, if somebody sends you a model and they say, does this, does this look right? I could sit in there for a day and think, yeah, that looks right. But until I really try to make that into fabrication drawings? I don't know. Right. And there's things that would look right in a model and then turn out to be wrong that you wouldn't notice until it's, it's far too late. Simple stuff, right? For instance, if you put the whole group in but don't specify the rotations and it's just four whole, it's going gonna, it's gonna to create a nightmare on the back end. Right. I was just thinking that one specifically with holes, you know, there, you don't know what's, what's the process of the person that did that in the first place. So when you're dealing with modeling software, there are ways to put in materials and hole groups and things like that, where the detailing comes out nice. There are also ways to do it to make your scrubber rip his hair out. Right. And there's other you know. things too, like, you know, locking connections, making them graphical putting stuff in that should be put in in one step in five steps, not, not following common modeling procedures or what we think of as common modeling procedures. 
Right. So picture even, you know, you, you need to bevel the end of a beam. I would use clip web as an end operation mm -hmm. because it's editable within the member edit screen. No problems. But there's plenty of people that'll go right to the material and cut on plane and turn it into a user main material. And now, oh, I need to shrink that beam. And now all of a sudden I've got problems because it's not moving. Right, because yeah. it's graphical. Yeah. And that gets us to one of the problems is from the fabricator's perspective and from the detailer's perspective is pricing this work. Mm -hmm. Because it's an at-risk situation. If I get into a job and it turns out that detailer really was 90% home and I quoted it to redraw this whole thing, I can make some serious bank and the fabricator would get screwed. But just as much the other way is true. And so it's, it's really next to impossible to move forward without just establishing a level of trust and being really, really verbose in your explanations of the costs. Yeah, and uh, also a lot of times a, a good move just in order to kind of negate some of that risk is rather than providing the upfront price, it's to provide an hourly rate and just a lot of communication every day. We're going to talk about what went on today, what were the issues, what went right, what went wrong, so that they know you're actually working, you know, as as the rescue detailer, but also they know that they're only getting what they're, they're only paying for what they're getting. And you know that you're getting paid for what you're doing. Yeah. So, you know, you've, you've that, that be could prepared. be the best solution too. Yeah. You've got to be prepared to communicate and to, I almost hate to say the word trust. Um, and it's trust, but verify, right? Sure. Trust what's coming out on the other side and be ready with a full explanation of what it took and why it took a little bit longer than you expected or, Hey, we got further along than we did. And you got to hope that the detailer is interested in keeping you around for more than just one project. So they're going to try to be, make you feel like you got a good product at a good price at the end of it. They want to make their money, but hopefully, Right, they're going to live by the adage: you can shear a sheep many times, but only skin it once. Right, right. Hopefully, they're out to build a relationship, and that's a great foot in the door to building a relationship. Is you know, if you get approached by a fabricator to say, "Hey, I, I had a detailer fall down, and I'm looking for somebody else," that's that's your window of opportunity to make a, a new friend for life. You know, they they could end up sending you a lot more work, so you don't want to beat them up too bad. Yeah. And it's, it's and, a good money making opportunity, but it's also a good business relationship building opportunity. Right. And the detailer, the fabricator should expect to pay a little bit extra for it because it's not, it's no longer a simple detailing project. It comes with all sorts of complications. Mm -hmm. Ian, it's, it's now an emergency, right? It's an emergency. You've got to deal with the people who have already approved things. You've got to deal with an existing model there's, there are a lot of complications to it and it's not a one-to-one. -one. So if you, if let's say the job was worth $20,000 and you paid $15,000 for your first detail, you know, for your, to your first detailer, there's a good chance you're still going to have to pay $20,000 to your next detailer. And it's unfortunate, but that's, that's kind of life. Sure. But also to put it in perspective, which I feel a lot of fabricators do tend to lose on this. They like to look at the whole dollar amount. Oh, it's, it's $20,000. It's one to 5% of your contract for that job. Yeah. That's usually about five. you'll, you'll live. It sucks. It's your profit margin. I'm sure, but you'll live. You know, oh, and you so can't it, afford to not do it quickly right. and decisively. That's that's my takeaway.
from all of this is be decisive, move very, very quickly to, to start getting this stuff in the hands of your new detailer that you've come to trust. Take those couple days. And if they're not responsive, if, if you can't feel that they know how important to you it is that this project gets started right away, find somebody else. They're not in the same space as you. They don't, they don't feel your pain. They don't feel your immediacy, your urgency. Then you can't be confident that, that they're going to actually dedicate the resources to it to make this happen. And be honest too about your overtime expectations and requirements. If you want somebody to basically work morning till midnight, tell them that. Tell them you need that and that you're willing to pay for it. The, if, if that's the case, if that's the kind of dedication that you want, I really recommend you find one of those basement type detailers where it's one or two guys, they're the owners. They don't have to pay overtime. They don't got to work. They're just basically, all right, guys, you know, I'm not going to be home for the next couple of days except for to sleep. I'm going to bury myself into this job and get it done for this guy. It's, it's a good place to go with something like that. Or, you know, us. You can hire us. <laughs> We've usually got some time on our hands. Or we'll make it. If the price is yeah. right, you know. Yeah, uh, legitimately, if the price is right, we'll, you, we will find the time and, and make it worth your while. And we've discussed it before, but our time versus other people's times can be more valuable. There's a reason we charge extra. It's because we do more. <laughs> you know, right. uh, we'll have a mechanic down the street and he's like, oh, I only charge 35 bucks an hour versus 90. Yeah, but it took you three days to change my brakes. I, I, that's not what I needed. I needed my car back. It was worth the extra 150 bucks for me to get it done quickly and, and reliably. Right. Or even, you know, the, the final price could be the same, but the schedules are just drastically different. Yeah. Drastically different. Uh, and the one cautionary tale in any project is if you need to part this out, if you need to build a little bit at a time, hard sequences with broken apart some material marks, broken apart main marks, it's the only way to do that, especially in SDS2, reliably. Each, each sequence needs to be its own essential building. If you try to do soft sequencing where you're like, oh, just get me what I need right now. Just get me the parts for this. It's going to create so many headaches within the software, within your purchasing, within your fabrication. You're going to get, but I already have four B5s. You know, why do I, why is this one getting changed? And where did, there's no four B5 anymore. Why is it on a different sheet? You got a hard line. That's the end of the sequence. We're producing all of it. It's in for fabrication, and that's it. We're not touching it. It's done. How many times has that bit us? Every time. When they come out, does it hurt? Every time. Yeah. Yep. It's going to hurt. It really is. It's going to hurt, and you're better off... You're, after you get that new detailer on board in a contract and you start seeing those things happen that you've been waiting for and he starts calling you, returning your calls, asking the questions and you start to see your, your life, your stress level is just going to plummet. Not even it, before it's done, just the, okay, we're moving in the right direction. Yeah. Your, your, your stress level plummets. And yeah, the, the grass under your feet will feel different. You get that, that new detailer smell and it's just, everything's going to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so get that move on, get it done. Stop dithering, get your contract and just, just trust your detail you work with. If you don't trust them, you shouldn't be working with them anyways. It's as soon as you lose that relationship where you think you've got to be checking up on this person all the time, it's time to start looking for somebody new. 
None of us are perfect. We miss deadlines, but when we do, it means that we're working nights, we're working overtime, and we're fully aware of the fact that we're missing deadlines and we're telling you about it and why. We're 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 communicating it in advance if possible. Yep. The only caveat I will give, the only time that I will dodge a phone call if I'm behind is if that phone call is going to take me away and this is this is just about finished. We are there. Right. In the next hour and a half, you're gonna have these drawings. Just let me finish them. That's it. It's my only my only excuse. Um, so that's it. Anything else? It's good for me. All right. All right, guys. Thanks for coming. Thanks for talking with us this episode on the Steel Forum. If you got questions, obviously hit us down below. As always, we ask that you hit those like and subscribe buttons and make sure that more detailers get a chance to talk with us, join the conversation, which we're hoping is going to move this industry forward. So that's it. We'll see you next year, next time here on the Steel Forum. Today's episode of the Steel Forum is sponsored by your local Masons Association. Masons, we'll get it right or you'll fix it for us.